Uh, hi there and welcome to day two of Architecture at the Edge uh, 2020 and the theme of course is boundaries. Um, this morning I'm joined by Dr. Ashley Rusk, of, who's Director of Belfast Based Architecture Practice Studio ITER. Uh, she's a PhD exploring spatial practices that navigates margins and boundaries as spaces of opportunity in Israel, Palestine and Northern Ireland and she is the inaugural chair of the RSUA Women in Architecture, lives in Belfast with her husband and two children. Uh, joining Ashling uh, this morning in conversation is uh, Dr. Peter Leary. He's the Vice Chancellor Fellow in History at Oxford Books University and author of Unapproved Roots, Histories of the Irish Border, 1922 to 72. Uh, he's winner, that was the winner of the American Conference of the Irish Studies Donald Murphy Prize. Uh, Peter's originally from County Fermanagh. He studied in Goldsmiths uh, University uh, of Ulster and Queen's University of Belfast and was the Canon Murray Fellow in Irish History at Oxford University and a Junior Research Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, UCL. He, his articles in the Irish Board have appeared in History Workshop Journal, Folklore and The Guardian newspaper. Uh, welcome both Ashling and Peter to Architect of the Edge. Great to have you here this morning. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, Ashley, I'm going to come to you first and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your research and on the in-between and, and I think even your name of your practice is Studio Idir, which translates as in-between. So obviously, you big about the in-between. Your, your world, yes. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll start there, shall we? Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Uh, thanks for organising this, Frank and Rosie. Um, I'm just going to do my screen share here. Uh, there we are. Hopefully you can all see that now. Um, so my research, as Frank just said, looks at boundaries, uh, boundaries between people and places in Northern Ireland and Israel-Palestine, exploring how to challenge, erode and transgress them. I call this liminal spatial praxis, which is not as complicated as it maybe sounds. It can be as simple as walking, as I'll show you over the next slides. Uh, since uh, Peter, who I should say at this point he used to be my, my next door neighbour, so it's lovely to be sharing the virtual stage with him today. Um, since his amazing book and the partial title of this uh, talk or event is Unapproved Roots, I thought I would share some stories from my research using that theme. Keeps it interesting for me and hopefully for you. Um, so this is an unapproved route if ever I saw one. It's a road that's been cut in half, something you see a fair bit of up here in Belfast. Uh, so what is liminal spatial praxis? It's a practice of being in between, uh, between two places, two binaries, two ways of practicing or knowing a space, for example, formal, for example, architectural knowledge or practice, and informal, local or lived uh, ways of knowing and being in a space. Uh, so starting with a Belfast example, you could say it's an easy one I'm going to start with because it's that soft interface in that there's no big wall there. Um, and that is, I was going to try and draw on the screen, but I don't think that's enabled, so I won't, don't need to. Uh, so this is an interface between, on the right vertically, you've got the Shore Road, uh, which is in Belf North Belfast, one of the arterial routes to, to uh, more of a um, typically PUL, Protestant Unionist Loyalist Street. And on the left, running vertically, you've got the Antrim Road, more typically Catholic, Nationalist, Republican. Uh, and these are, this is where Skegenale Avenue on the right and Glandor Avenue on the left meet at a little roundabout that's inside that circle. Um, that was, that's an interface. It was the location of kind of rioting and clashes and became, as a result, the shop that was there closed, became derelict, got knocked down, and you've got this sort of wasteland that nobody wants to build on just to the north there. Um, so that's the site that I'm going to chat about. Uh, the, this is... Uh, has been turned into Pease Park uh, over the last number of years, eight years or so, making temporary meanwhile use of contaminated land that a developer's in no hurry to develop. Uh, so give Pease a chance, love and Pease, puns fully intended. We also got on the bottom right here a container shop that local entrepreneur Will Hare opened, Sinna's shop. Chickens running about at the front of it often, don't think in that picture. So a group of committed local individuals started gardening there every week, uh, just making meanwhile use of the site. Uh, and they were massively supported by local artists, collective PS Squared, um, and initially had a little bit of funding in 2012 from Temporary Places Project. Uh, not everybody loves it, 
Um, there are local people who feel that this garden is bringing down the value of houses in the area, the opposite of gentrification. Uh, but I think you could agree it's an improvement on what was there before on the top left, but maybe not as desirable for those people as some nice new houses, but no one was in a hurry to build those on an interface. Um, so what was formerly an interface, an edge, um, where people wouldn't necessarily cross between one side and another is now a hub, a place where people rub shoulders, although maybe not anymore, uh, at, the, at the shop. Uh, and they, you know, encounter each other. They stripped off bits of the fencing from around the outside of this land to encourage people to use it as a shortcut, walk their dogs through there, an unapproved route, if you like. Um, it's not without its troubles. Vandals occasionally knock down the billboard or rip out the vegetables. But the attitude of the gardens is, is remarkable. They just fix it and keep going. Uh, they make the ghetto blaster youth coming in to smoke in the pagoda welcome. They, when a local lady cut down the fabric of their teepee in protest, they left it there for some time, sort of half cut down as her equally valid spatial expression on the site. Uh, presence and production, those are the words of artist Thomas Hirshhorn, uh, quoted by the PS Squared lead curator, Peter Mitchler. Uh, he says through their presence and production, through community art and gardening, these practices have transformed this interface into a place an unapproved route through and around land that isn't theirs. This is a liminal spatial praxis. What, I hear you ask, about these, uh, those great big walls though, hard interfaces. You can't very well make a route through those or put a garden in the middle of them. Um, this is a 650 metre long Alliance Glen Rin piece wall, also in North Belfast. Um, they have like that first slide I showed you, roads, uh, which have been, this is Berwick Road being cut in half, that's one side of it, that's the other, they've actually built a house on it and its garden, so that road is never getting opened up again. Um, so this is, uh, these, the following images are from a project that we've been working on with Starling Start for the Department of Justice this year, engaged, looking at this wall. We were asked to come up with design concepts for the future of the wall, from keeping it as it is to removing it and any other ideas that local residents could come up with and we could with them in between. Don't have a lot of time to get into it, um, but here are some of the images that we produced. Uh, you'll note the reference to Rael San Patello's fabulous pink seesaws on the Mexican border there. Um, windows, maybe a gate, public artworks, meanwhile use of the wasteland to the side of it. Uh, we were told that we'd have to organise two community event meetings, one either side of the wall because people wouldn't come to one place together. And we also weren't sure how many people would actually turn up to that sort of a consultation event in a local community centre. So we had an idea for a creative happening. We'd uh, bring a domestically scaled, non-intimidating fun space to the local streets and make it shared across time and as an experience, if not literally shared in the same moment by the same people. So this is Daisy, the yellow camper van on an invitation flyer that we put through every letterbox in the local community centres and spaces, inviting people to come and have a conversation with us. You can see by the date there, 5th of March, it was just before lockdown. Um, and here we are doing our thing in Daisy. Um, there's a wee short video on Vimeo, if anybody's interested, just a minute and a half long, that sort of captures the day. I've asked Rosie to put it on the chat, so if you want to look it up afterwards, you can. Um, uh, we had daisy badges to hand out for people to wear with colouring and modelling for the kids to make little houses for our bigger model that showed the impact of li on light and view of different scales of walls. Um, and then this model just to show, I can't draw again, but basically that on the right of the model, that white line is the 650 metre piece wall and we basically did a full circle, drove up the road on the right to the top. At the top there, slightly to the right off the model, is the Holy Cross School that you may remember in 2001, 2002, the school kids having difficulty going to school. So that's this area. Back down the other side, Alliance Avenue, we made six stops, spoke to 89 people, and it was a, yeah, a really enjoyable event. Moving then to the warmer, temperature-wise, cooler, politically, climbs of the West Bank. Um, and the very literal practice of walking, because walking, is a form of liminal social praxis. Um, and so this is walking about approved routes. Um, this walking connects places ephemerally. I love this quote from Bassam al Mahor. When he walks, he says he makes Palestine big again. In her book about the history of walking, writer Rebecca Solnit in, uh, describes walking as a mode of making the world as well as being in it. Walking changes temporarily the relationship between the places it connects, as I like to think does driving a big yellow camper van in a circle around a peaceful. Um, 
And so this is an NGO called Rewalk, who did a project called Rewalk Palestine. Do you see what they did there? Um, and they basically took uh, sharing that philosophy around walking and connecting places. They published a series of walking routes of Palestine, looking of the West Bank, looking, uh, they looked like something you get for the Alps or somewhere, um, encouraging people to research the fragmented geographies of the West Bank through walking, bringing those places experientially closer together um, momentarily in a walk and normalizing this idea of walking in a place where it isn't really done that much. Um, so they also, these guys who are their, their heritage NGO, um, concerned with protecting the built heritage in Palestine. Uh, that can be from literally just fixing up old buildings to really progressive radical blue sky thinking ways. Um, as, as the director Khaldun Bashara says, heritage is always political. Uh, they travel to site by ambulance when there's a lockdown on and travel is forbidden, but you're allowed to go to hospital in an ambulance for an emergency, so they pay an ambulance to take them to site where development is forbidden in certain villages, they fix up houses and convert outbuildings from the inside so you can't see, sneaking materials in on the Sabbath when there's less military presence or observation, which are all ways to subvert and make pro progress under occupation. Another NGO, in uh, this time in Tel Aviv, Zohrot, they their focus is on planning for the unapproved route of return of the Palestinian diaspora. Uh, they start by making return visits to villages that were destroyed in the Nakba, the 1948 Palestinian exodus, uh, hundreds of villages, and they go walking there with former villagers and their descendants, leaving signs where buildings used to be, like this one on the left, um, for cemetery. And then they work with the old villagers, like the center image, making memory maps of the destroyed villages. And they engage architects at the image on the right to create plans uh, of things that, you know, politically impossible at present, but that they're not stopping them from planning for the return of the Palestinian diaspora. Um, their various practices are in between in relation, not just to place, but also time from the signs, the current reality, like the signs, what was the memory maps and what could be the plans. This is liminal spatial praxis. Back to Ireland then to finish off and um, closer to home. This is the Irish border in Carlingford Lock, which I think we'll soon be hearing a little bit more about from someone who's much more of an expert on it than me. Uh, can you see it? No, me neither. Um, can you tell the north from the south? What the difference? No, there's no change in road markings and speed signs from miles to kilometers on this image to help you uh, sort of spot our blink and you miss it border. Uh, another soft border then until a hard Brexit does whatever it'll do to that. So there I've, I've said the B word, it's out of my system. I will not mention it again. Um, another project I'm gonna talk about, about walking again and mapping, excuse the poor quality of the images on this slide. Um, these are part of, uh, this is Garrett Carr, a lecturer in creative writing at Queen's University Belfast. He's also written some children's stories in the fictional Donegal town and he's made some maps. And these images are part of his fabulous map of unapproved routes, uh, unofficial connections across the Irish border. He walked and boated the entire length of the border and took a record of any crossings or transgressions that didn't appear on an official OS map. Stepping stones, gates and hedgerows, planks placed across streams by kids uh, and created his own map of connections that not only represented the transgressions across the border, uh, you know, in, in the initial version, this is version three, but in the initial versions, the border wasn't even there at all. And this, you can see just a wee faint line there. Um, so basically the border isn't really there, but yet it is brought in, it's present even in its absence, um, brought into being by the very things that cross and erode it. What a project. This is liminal spatial praxis to me. And I couldn't finish without an example from the west of Ireland, given that this is architecture at the edge. Um, and I wish I was there down there with you all. Uh, it's uh, a fascinating project that I haven't researched or ever spoken about before, but I've just been visiting and following it with interest over the years. Um, if we were all in a room together, I'd ask you to guess, but alas, I cannot. So I'll just tell you that this is Acklehenge, that circle on the right of the slide. The result of a remarkable unapproved route that Joe McNamara, property developer and protester that I'm sure needs no introduction, tracked up the hill onto archaeologically rich common land in 2011 with no planning or permissions to create this astounding, profound Neolithic style structure, completely unlawfully. In fact, he was jailed for a couple of days as a result. It's something else. Um, I can't help but think of it as another quintessentially liminal structure. It's caught between times, Neolithic and yet utterly now, and with the crude precast concrete and its rebar connections. If you haven't been, I would urge you to go. 
Um, but you know, we'll walk the last video, you'll scratch the bottom of your car like we did uh, on our last visit. It's an utterly liminal and compelling place. It's, you know, between inside and outside, order and chaos, old and new, treasure, trash, should it stay, should it go? And while that debate continues, it stays there in its temporary permanence until who knows, we might just live to see it listed as a national monument, a memorial perhaps to the excesses of the Celtic tiger and the collapse that followed too much and too little in one, but that is a conversation perhaps for another day. Uh, that's my kid a few years ago there in the middle. If anyone's been watching Dark on Netflix or something like me with the yellow coat caught in between times, this image now gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um, I think it's interesting that McNamara chose such a liminal edge condition of a place as Ackle Island to, to do this. Although, of course, he's got form there, um, almost but not quite completing a house the locals have nicknamed the Taj Mahal for its modesty and taking down the perfectly fine village in and Kiel to build a hotel and nightclub with an underground car park, which is what every rural village needs in Ireland, and only getting as far as digging the big hole before the crash came and work stopped. And that's still there. Um, so Acklehenge takes the form of something transcendent and sublime, henge structure, while being at the same time gritty and crude. It's a social and spatial transgression. This too is the result of an unapproved route and is a liminal spatial practice at perhaps a more controversial end of things. So to conclude, I'll just say that it's a, it's a practice of eroding boundaries and building connections by locating in between in relation to time, place, binaries, people. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ashling. Um, lots, lots of material there um, to, for discussion. But I think we'll, we'll go straight on to Peter, actually. Um, and um, then we, we'll come back. We'll come back to that in the discussion, yeah? So, uh, Peter. Thank you. Um, is that image there? Are you seeing the image? Yep. Yeah, great. Okay, so thank you, um, Frank, and thank you, Ashley, and thank you, everyone who's um, organized this event and for inviting me to speak. I too wish I was there with you, but um, sadly not. Um, and I've made, I made very clear in advance of, of, of today that I know nothing whatsoever about um, architecture, but I'm told that I'm assured that that's not a problem. So what I'm going to talk about, as has been mentioned, is the, the Irish border. Um, historically, yes, um, but also in a way that hopefully draws out some of the, the spatial aspects that I think are important to any understanding of how the border and partition have been and indeed are experienced as a, a, a line on the map, um, a representation of one kind of space, the, the, the territory of the state, as a representational or symbolic space which, uh, um, through which politics and political aspirations are expressed, but also bound up with other meanings, power, uh, identity and division. Um, and also, and this sort of follows on, I think, uh, neatly from what Ashley was saying, the, 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 uh, and, and I think it's also, um, in some ways, most importantly for me, the kind of spatial practices and strategies through which um, that have been employed by the inhabitants of this borderland space for whom partition and the border have been a, and, and are a fact of everyday life. And of course, these things, these aspects overlap and, and, and are um, tied up also with history and with time, which is where, where, where I come in, I suppose. Um, and also, I think it's interesting, some of the comments that have just been made, I think the border has a peculiar relationship with the past, with time, maybe we can come on to, to, to that in the, in the discussion. But let me begin with the line on the map. Um, and this somewhat sort of peculiar stretch of, of, of border, graphically uh, described by local writer Shane Connaughton as um, an orgy of political and geographical confusion. In the center of this map, you can see this, um, I can probably, oh no, that way, point to that. The center of the map is that you can see this sort of uh, gray area uh, known as the Dromoli Salient, sometimes um, the Connons, consisting of 16 townlands of County Monaghan, and um, that since partition in the early 1920s has been and remains completely inaccessible by road or rail except through Northern Ireland. It's remembered locally as the, the, the product of some long forgotten feud between petty kings 
But at the time when the Ulster counties were shired or created in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, in and around the time of the plantation, the area was probably included in County Monaghan rather than Fermanagh, owing to the presence there of turf. But obviously for centuries before partition elevated it to a, an international border, this uh, carnival of county boundaries had little effect on everyday life. As the Reverend John Mira um, of the local Church of Ireland explained when he led a small unionist delegation to the Irish Boundary Commission in 1925, we never thought about the difference between one county and another before that change was made. Travelling from this no man's land to, to markets in Clonus or Monaghan Town uh, meant crossing the border twice. But inconvenience was not the only thing that unsettled Reverend Mira and his colleagues, for while the rectory where Mira lived was in Fermanagh, those local social spaces in which their identity was anchored and articulated, the church itself, the school, parochial hall, Protestant Union Hall, which is marked here on the map, were all in the Irish Free State. So the United Kingdom, Ireland, even Ulster and the parish of Grimully were all divided by the border leaving no sort of previously imagined community, to borrow Benedict Anderson's famous phrase, left intact. In now, Dramoli might have been, and, and still is, an extreme case, but in some respects, I think it can be seen as a, a, a microcosm for the region. And indeed, others were in more peculiar, more unusual circumstances still. Uh, in 19... 58 uh, journalists reporting on the, the cross border, uh, the closure of cross border roads, paid a by then customary call to the home of two middle aged bachelor brothers, John and Phelan Murray. The thatched farmhouse in which these brothers lived stood on the, right on the county boundary between Fermanagh in Northern Ireland and Cavan, since the south, uh, Cavan in the south. And since partition, the Irish border cut straight through the dining come bedroom at the centre of the home. Now, visitors' work of this kind were quite common in the Murray House, starting with the taking of this picture, um, which shows their, their parents that had 10, ten years earlier, um, who were since deceased. And a favourite trick of the brothers was to sit, on the sit uh, at the table in the six counties while eating food, um, eating their breakfast from the 26 counties, or sit on either side of the table passing the salt back and forward from one state to another. But on this particular occasion that I refer to, they had something, uh, something else in mind. A few weeks earlier, in 1958, uh, the, the County Fermanagh Unionist Association raised objections to John's inclusion on the local electoral register on the grounds that he slept with only his head in that county. The rest of his body, the objectors maintained, was in County Cavan, which was a different local authority area and a different state as well. So. With the reporters there, John Murray decided uh, he wanted to set the record straight, posing for them in this most intimate of spaces so they could show the world how when he lay asleep at night, the border ran, in fact, across the heart. Now, passing the border meant inconvenience, delay, long detours in places, and frustration at the hands of an inflexible bureaucracy. For those carrying goods, uh, even non dutiable commodities were, had to be recorded for statistical purposes. The introduction of customs controls um, on April Fool's Day 1923 was accompanied by a, an agreement between London and Dublin which divided the border roads into three types. There were the approved crossings, of which there were initially 16, were those, they were those equipped with customs posts, uh, customs facilities. And the only, good, only routes by which dutiable goods, including motor vehicles, could legally be brought over. The bulk of the remainder, the approximately 180 in total, were classed as, these, as, the, as unapproved. These were roads that could be used by persons not carrying taxable items, provided they travelled by foot, uh, cycle or horse-drawn vehicle. Officially, the only exemption to this was a small number of local doctors, vets and clergy who were issued with permits, allowing them to travel on approved crossings by car, while unofficially permission was sometimes granted for funerals. There also existed a handful of concession roads, which are 
still referred to as such in, in many border areas. And these were un otherwise unapproved crossings um, that linked either two places in the south or two places in the north. And the concession was that you could travel south to south or north to north. Initially agreed on, a, on an ad hoc basis, they were, made, um, they were later formalized in some instances. But these, could be, these arrangements could be fragile and subject to the changing winds of national and international politics. So in some ways it was a practical solution, but in others it, uh, the, the concession road generated new problems. So until the mid-1960s, for example, the residents of the village of Cullerville in South Armagh, if they wanted to travel to Castle Blaney and stay within the law, had to, uh, they, were, they were compelled to set out in the opposite direction. They had to uh, then cross over into the south at the um, approved crossing um, and then get back onto the concession road, driving uh, back past their own doors through Northern Ireland, through the village of Colleville, um, to, to Castle Blaney. Um, because, of course, you weren't allowed to stop on the concession road anywhere within Northern Ireland. So it's difficult to dispute the, the, the description of one American wartime observer who described it as one of the worst examples of frontier bureaucracy in existence. And, of course, it was the customs post um, at least until the, the recent troubles that came to define the border um, for many. But as the recent debates around Brexit, um, as has been mentioned, have, have, have again highlighted, border communities have never merely accepted this sort of imposition, but have often found creative ways to, to cir circumvent the obstacles that it created, even sometimes turning the border to their own ends. Now, the most uh, obvious example of this, of course, is smuggling, which began on some scale, a relatively small scale, almost immediately. It really took off from the 1930s in the period uh, known as the, the sort of economic war or the, the, the trade war, which saw Britain impose punitive tariffs of, uh, uh, on Irish livestock, on imports of Irish livestock, and led to a deluge of animals across the, across the boundary. In 1933, a letter written to the Stormont Ministry from Armagh complained of being unable to sleep at night owing to the noise of cattle accompanied by strange drivers that have to inquire the way to Killyleigh Fair. But even this was overshadowed when World War II and the emergency produced a second great smuggling outbreak, characterised this time by butter and bacon, or white flour and tea, concealed about the persons of the housewives and other women who then dominated the trade. Oops. So by, by 1941, exasperated guard was writing to, in, in Dundalk, was writing to his superiors. There is an urgent need of women searchers on the customs staffs, as it is housewives who are the principal offenders. Men searchers are helpless. On several occasions at the trains at Dundalk Station, women have told customs men that they had butter and dared them to come and get it. Asked as part of a, an Abbey Theatre production in two, a project in 2005, what did it take to make a successful smuggler? One by then quite senior border resident replied, a pair of interlocked knickers with good elastic in the legs. And of course, memories such as these, as these uh, throw some light on how experience of the border could be gendered as well as small scale and intimate, intimate with implications for the person, the body, and even private space. But there are others too who took advantage of the border and of its complexities. Um, and Ashley has asked me specifically to make some reference to, to, to cockfighting banned since um, the, the 19th century. Uh, which experienced a renaissance with lo local press reporting large-scale tournaments held on the very boundary with stalls selling teas, coffees, sandwiches and drink. These accounts in the, the local newspapers often appear in the sporting columns, but they were focused less on the fate of the birds than on the game of cat and mouse. The arrival of the RUC might trigger a stampede into the south, 
until the appearance of the guards would the prompt a return migration. On one occasion, fights were conducted in the south while a large crowd of spectators watched from the safety of the north, while on another, the fighting pit was constructed on a raft and floated in the middle of the river that marked the boundary. And humor, uh, as humor as well as many of these practices can serve to subvert power, but it also sometimes solves pain. And of course, for much of the 20th century, the Irish border was both the site and the subject of the conflicts, including violence, of which it was itself a product. For a century, border communities have sought to preserve this permeability in the face of attempts to impose it as a barrier. And they continue, uh, they, they continue today to, to inhabit these spaces in between. Frank, I think you're you're muted. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, fascinating uh, insight into uh, that situation that that is just continuous. Um, uh, I think this the bureaucracy which you describe is sort of it's sort of just so frustrating, and I suppose um, you know human nature just just cannot kind of like um just just can't sort of tolerate that kind of thing but we, we will find a way you know to kind of overcome circumstances like like this um what's coming through for me uh, from both talks i suppose is is this idea of um you know the desire i suppose that desire to 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 overcome uh, obstacles i suppose um, but uh, the sense of walking um, seems very kind of embedded into into both, um, it, well, particularly with Ashlyn's work, um, but also creating points at the interface um, where there can be some sort of meeting um, or overlap between the desire to make a connection between people, which is, you know, which we have, we just have, it's, it's in our natures, and and to to overcome these sort of obstacles that sort of are structures that seem to be put in our in our way. Um, I'm kind of, I suppose I'd want to ask Ashley a little bit more about her work um, with Starling Start and how uh, the research on Palestine kind of informed that, um, how working with two different communities but at one point. Um, to maybe expand on that a little bit and tell us a bit who who is who are you engaging with there on the ground, because as Peter describes, it really is a, the people. It's all about lived experience, um, and you're kind of arriving into this situation where um, you're you're sort of bringing introducing uh, a new way of meeting. Um, at that interface, and maybe maybe just tell us a little bit more about about that because it, there was so much there. I think it, to delve back into it a little bit. Sure, um, and I, you were breaking up a wee bit, so I picked up most yeah. of that. I think, but I lost you a couple of times. But um, okay. in terms of how that project that we did with Starling Start was informed by the research in Palestine and Northern Ireland, uh, it, like really, really a lot. I think cause I spent eight years doing that PhD and looking at the re really diverse spatial practices that are around connection, but in really different ways. And you can't sort of just, you don't come out of something like that with a, a guidebook, like this is how you do it. You go to a peace wall and you do, if you do these things, it'll all turn out. Uh, but there's just a lot of, I suppose an ethos of trial and error of just turning up, leaving your ego at the door and talking to people and listening to people. So, you know, the people we spoke to, first of all, it was just trying to get directly to the people most affected. So that's why we figured we'll just go there. We'll go to the streets where they live in a camper van and invite them to come out to this completely non-threatening, fun, bizarre thing that's happening on the street, uh, which really seemed to work. Uh, obviously not everybody wanted to talk to us or could, um, but a lot of people did come out and we had some really interesting conversations. And some of the, you know, obviously you come into anything with your own idea of what should happen like I'd love to see that wall and lots of them come down but I recognize that I am not 
you know, I'm not local. It, it, I'm not the person most affected by it. And the people that live there have very legitimate reasons for thinking they need those for their safety. So it's taking seriously every suggestion that is made to you, including some people telling us that they would like that fence, that what is essentially a metal fence up in the upper part of that piece wall to be taken down and replaced with a brick wall, the same size, which, you know, from our work as architects and we went and spoke with engineers about it you know we know the reality of that would be actually way worse than a fence way more permanent if you actually spent the money building a brick wall that size it would be like a, a mega prison wall very hard to build very expensive to build very hard to take away but we did visualize that as one of the options and ideas because that genuinely came out of those conversations um mm -hmm. and so yeah and I think I'm probably rambling a bit, but the, the, the research, I think what I drew out in my PhD from all of the spatial stories I looked at were different approaches, like leaving your ego behind, like walking, like turning up and being present and producing something on the divide that all informed the way that we went about speaking to people about that interface. And it's, we're still learning and experimenting every, every time we do something like that, we'll, we'll learn new things and try new things. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. So is it, is it part of a longer term sort of engagement that you're you're hoping to sort of um, embed within that community uh, and and sort of you know, you're having a dialogue with that particular place and that in that particular location uh, is specific to there or the you know uh, that that project was a very concise project to come up with the design concepts and hand it back to DOJ that there was at one point talk that it would come out to tender again, we could be involved in the next stages, but they've taken a decision over lockdown to take the, these sorts of projects forward through central, their own sort of CPD department uh, moving forward. So we will not be involved any further officially with that community, but would be very happy, we'll be following it with interest and be happy to be involved in any way we can. Um, but no, just always open to other opportunities. Uh, starting Start and I are just involved in a tender at the minute to look at, um, you know, look at Belfast's alleyways as again unofficial routes. Maybe if I ever speak about unofficial routes again, it will be about this, the, those ones. But mm. all the network of back alleys around the city, which has been some publicity over lockdown in Belfast, probably in other places, about terraces of houses making use of those. But at the same time, you've got the city council's trying to alligate them all, as happened on the terrace that Peter and I were um, lived on. Uh, and so just, yeah, uh, whatever whatever work we do, we're applying those same principles. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a sense from that answer um, and sort of thinking back on some of what, what Peter described. Um, it seems to me there's been some obstacles put, put in the way of your actual work. Uh, you know, you're trying to, start something off you've, you've developed uh, some ideas you've been working with the community at you know at an initial stage and, and that suddenly the you know um the mechanisms for engagement which sort of become box ticking exercises very often um decided to take over and say thank you very much we'll, we'll take it from here so are you going to so you're, you're almost talking about we'll find another way we'll find another you find another your own unapproved route uh, back into back into engagement, maybe through the alleyways or whatever. But um, is is there sort of is would this be kind of like in your experience as uh, in you know participatory kind of design projects like this? Um, are there obstacles in your way to working with communities in these kind of settings? Um, are you know you also mentioned that uh, with the garden, I suppose that the the um, the the shop um i mean was there was that pretty straightforward to get permission to have the the garden shop there is it still there um uh, yeah no that was i mean there are always obstacles and it's like that's what i find fascinating about margins about the you know borders where pla two places meet whether it's the irish border or these interfaces um that they're full of obstacles and it, you've got to work with people working with people isn't straightforward you know it's not as easy as coming in top down and delivering a you know just building building a wall between northern Ireland, the south or you know taking down all the interfaces like the t-buck commitment to, was made to do by 2023 um but that is the, it's the process that's important, maybe more than the outcome in a way. Uh, you know, so where there are obstacles, yes, that shop, that container shop, has, that's a whole other story. 
um, but they had difficulty getting permission. The guy owned, bought the site, got permission to build apartments and, and a shop there, didn't have the money to so put the container shop there in the meantime as a meanwhile use. And then planning, tried to get them to take it away because it didn't, um, you know, it was detrimental to the, to the area. And if you would have seen the, what the area was like at the time with derelict houses around it. Um, and this shop was bringing this really great local resource that people were using. And still he struggled to get retrospective temporary permission for it, which it now has. And it is still there. Still going strong. Right. Great place. Worth a visit if you're in North Belfast. Um, but yeah, I think it, I, I think that's a, a, par, a good parallel with Peter's work. You know, the, the like the way where there's something like a border and an issue, people just find ways, creative ways to get around it. And it's, it's magic, mm -hmm. smuggling, cockfighting. But also, I think you know, I think it's interesting you say about the people who wanted to to, to build the wall. You know, because because I think we can you know we, you can romanticise it as well. You know, people do find ways of of getting through, and life does find ways to overcome. But people also like to build walls as well you know so people do want to sort of delineate themselves and and and, and you know kind of um demarcate themselves in various ways as well so there's always that tension there between um the, the sort of the desire to separate and and to identify and classify one thing from another and to to draw lines and boundaries and and, and um to kind of overcome i think in the in the it's interesting to talk about the, the urban spaces in Belfast and the 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 because the, the peace lines there really correspond to to the um to to the political divisions or cultural divisions what have you what I think one of the, the complexities of the border is that it doesn't you know that the, there is a local um political geography of territory and space but it's but it's there's no way you can. There's no no line that sort of corresponds to one community being here and one one um, community being there. I mean, if anything, historically it was a kind of altitudinal stratification um, where 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 you had the sort of plantation settlements along the the river valleys and the, the sort of better lower lying soil and and the Catholic communities then in in the sort of um, uh, higher up areas, which in the sort of in, in the in the geography of the Drumlin Belt, you can imagine the kind of patchwork of of distribution that that um, sort of generates. So so it's it's um so, so so the problem there is is that you know the border actually doesn't function as an interface. Um, you know that there, 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 there's nowhere along the border really where you have um, you know one community on one side and another community on the other. In fact, almost everywhere it's sort of uh, partly because it follows the lines of rivers or mountain tops or or whatever actually it 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 mm. cuts in it cuts through communities that are um politically similar at, at sort of most points along its length so it's a, it's a kind of it's, it's an attempt to translate uh yeah. something into into a boundary but, that doesn't fit it's like it's like actually the, the, the behavior of people i suppose is the point uh, Perhaps that's trying to make, but the, the social and spatial transact transgressions that people will people will just do it, mm. um, and you know that the the Ackle Henge that you showed Ashling towards the end, you know you kind of you admired that because um, it sort of displayed this sort of uh, you know just a way of you know I I will I will do whatever I wish and, and you know it's not just sort of tracking across some sort of uh, um, a little river with with some sort of stepping stones. It's actually a very bold uh, statement, and I suppose we see these sort of statements along you know along the 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 border, even if there isn't an infrastructure uh, between you know the Irish border as you describe it, Peter. People will still uh, people still want to make some sort of uh, statement about um, that it's their place, I suppose. Um, that perhaps they don't see uh, any big, you know, that they have to put their own stamp on on where they're where they are from, and you know, there's little territories in all these places. Um, perhaps um, it's just that the ones in particular streets in Belfast, those territories are, are very much more um, sort of defined, and I suppose uh, have, have pressure. They're kind of pressure points, but uh, along the border, then it seems to be a very different kind of um, way of expressing those things. Um, 
where they're, they're, they're taken out. Um, I did notice that Tom Keeley was in the chat. <laughs> Tom, I don't know if you'd like to join in this conversation. Um, if he's still there, because I know he's doing a lot of work on this. How, do, how would you feel about that, Tom? Because um, I know that Tom is doing some really interesting work on this with his uh, Border Hedge School. Um, hi. Tom, hiya. How are you? Sorry, not me. Hello, hello, hello. hello. Uh, where am I? Can you hear me? There he is, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it, the, what you were just saying, Peter, about the border um, working um, in terms of altitude, um, I've never actually thought of that before. I mean, I thought, I thought about the kind of different communities being on the good land, but not, how, not quite how um, it operates at height. Um, which is kind of totally fascinating, actually. Um, but I also also really enjoying what you were saying, Ashley, about um, walking, um, and that's that. Although, um, while I was looking at quite different things when I when I walked the length of the border last um, March, um, quite quite differently to what Garrett did, um, in that I was looking mainly at architecture and landscape. Um, those kind of that, that, that crisscrossing that web of borderness that you kind of can't get away from was something I kept on kind of coming back to and trying to work out as well about whether there was a um, a distinct kind of border architecture, um, an ad hocness that kind of definitely speaks to Ackle Henge as well, and kind of a a, a design of uh, necessity or pragmatism rather than a um, a design of um, know what the word is uh design i don't know um, but i don't know whether that's border specific or, or something that kind of exists in many rural communities um across ireland and and elsewhere thanks tom um so i mean i suppose both in your project uh and the one that ashing presented and and peters there is this sort of mapping connections to the landscape um and it, it does seem a little bit, I kind of wonder where the people are on this, where the communities are on this. I still don't really see them. Um, I know that Peter, you described the sort of, you know, the practices, you know, of the people. Um, and do you, do you think um, in sort of making that connection to the landscape that Ashton has done, um, perhaps we need to sort of you know, I just, I just want to wonder where the communities are in this process uh, and in the practice. Yeah, well, I think, I think it, I mean, in partly it sort of depends on, it's a reflection of different scales and people's different relationships to the place or the space in terms of, you know, how, how proximate they are. And I suppose walking comes into that in a way, the, the sort of, yeah. because, because it's a slow mode of transport and, you know, you're, you're, you're engaging in your, uh, or moving, not transport, moving around. Um, so you're, you know, you're kind of with the the, um, the border if you're crossing it in in a different way. I think the idea of the, the walking of the border, I think, is, is quite an interesting thing. I thought I thought it was very interesting reading um, Garrett's book that, that because actually to walk the length of the border, as as, as you've done as well, is is, is it's not really what it's designed for, if that makes sense. But you know, most people don't walk along the border; they sort of cross it and pass it, <laughs> pass it in an instinct. So you know, there are a few places where the roads themselves mark the um, uh, the, the, the car. You know, the, the border runs up the middle of the, the, the carriageway in one or two places. Um, so if you're on one side, you're in one, and on the other side in, in the other. But by and large, people cross the border in the, the sort of um, blink of an eye. So so it's a kind of it's a transgressive way to to traverse the border, I suppose, in that sense, to to, to um, go along its length. But I, but I always think you know the scale thing is, um, you know, you know if you if you look at if you look at the map, if you look at from a national perspective, you 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 get one picture, and then it's, it's like it's like the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics in one way. If you look at on a big scale, you see one thing happening. Whereas if you look very at a very close up and small scale, you see very different things. You see people moving back and forward. You see, um, you, you see the absence of the division that's sort of evident on, on a map or um, sort of from, from a national per perspective. And I think walking is a very important 
or has been historically a very important element in the in in the in the um the village of Kilty Clahar, for example, for example, the, the local um, where the roads were closed and the bridges were blown up um by, by the British Army, the 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 um the local Church of Ireland community um built uh, a, a footbridge across which enabled them a lot of them lived in Fermanagh in the village and the church itself was in was in Leitrim and they, they, they built this footbridge um to come across to, to, to so they could be able to attend worship there and that sort of goes back in a way to, to the the fact that you could use the unapproved um routes if you were on foot um people were still able to to, to cross uh, where roads were closed they were able to sort of make make their way um on foot so if you were close enough to walk to somewhere the actual a lot of the disruption caused by the border you could you could um you know you, you were able to circumvent it you, you were able to to, to overcome it, whereas if you were further away and you needed to drive, then then um, those those disruptions came into play a bit more. Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking, um, I kind of have this desire to do a little walk along the border myself, as opposed to talking to you all. Um, I mean, is this is this what we're perhaps, if there was a proposition, um, you know, or a future proposition, would it, would it be something that you're encouraging people to kind of say, Take your own walk, find in your own, find your own way, make your own route, go and explore the border, uh, take a walk, you know, um, record what you see, you know, uh, you don't know who you're going to meet. Um, those are the interactions. That's where the engagement perhaps is going to happen. But um, whether it's at the border, on the line, or or further away from it, I suppose you know when they talk about sort of strategies to kind of uh, you know, they're talking about parking bays, they're sort of set back from the border, that's not infrastructure and that kind of thing, as uh, solutions for, for, the, uh, for yeah. the customs or whatever it is. But so does it really matter how far you are situated away from the physical border, whether you're in, uh, you know, a particular street in Belfast, um, you know, are actually, you know, right up, you know, on the, on the town there at, at, uh, in that townland of, of Drummouli. Um, should we just be all out walking, uh, but not not marching, uh, you know? But should we all be out walking, sort of solitary kind of more walks? Is that is that a form of public engagement that perhaps, uh, you know, this this idea of beating the bounds that they, they do in in some some parts of London, and um, where you kind of you walk around the territory just just sort of at the edge of it, and, and uh, but it's more of a celebration, I suppose. And and is it coming together and joining together and you don't know who's going to turn up? Um, yeah, I don't I don't know what the weather's like where you are, but it's it's pouring down with rain here. I don't want to go out um, <laughs> walking on the border. But I think a, a lot of it, to make a more serious yeah. point, a lot of it obviously is 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 water. And and, and uh, yeah. you know that Gareth Carr in his book he, he used to went with a canoe. I think a, 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 an inflatable um, or you know, collapsible canoe or whatever. So you know, which which again is Ashton highlighted that the, you know which which is in a way the most interesting but it's well it's complicated actually because partly it's, it represents the sort of ongoing division and disagreement there's no agreement where the, the water boundary lies you know in in, in um lock boyle and, and, and carlingford lock um really because the the, the, the anglo-irish treaty says suggests one thing and the, the government of ireland act suggests something different so there's always been this dispute about where you know where, which um the, you know where where the the sort of boundaries of the the um uh, that lies, but it means that you know like Lock Foyle and Carlingford Lock are this kind of um on one side one hand there are places there's sort of there's there, there there's conflict over and on another on 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 the other hand that there, there there are places that's kind of a no man's land a, a place where there's a, an element of freedom people people can um you know. In, enjoy them as they like or have been able to 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 kind of historically so so um so yeah so i i, I was just saying on, i was picking up on the walking thing we might you might get a bit wet you might get your feet wet so yeah not your head definitely <laughs> billy Connolly said there's no such thing as the wrong weather just the wrong clothes isn't it well and <laughs> um, we're actually i can't believe we've been talking for nearly an hour um but so i want to invite uh anyone in the chat to, to ask some questions of Ashley Peter and and Tom uh, if they'd like. I typed a question for Tom. I'd love oh, to hear about how he did his border walk. Uh, um, 
Yeah, yeah I did it. Um, it well, the, the original reason I got um, interested in the border was through reading Contabine's book, Bad Blood. And I, I found it in a secondhand bookshop in Derry about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. I can't remember. And was kind of didn't know what to do with it. But eventually it coalesced into this kind of PhD. And um, I did it in one go um, on my own. Um, and actually, I think I, I, I definitely, I stayed in um, one of the B&Bs that Garrett definitely stayed in because the woman was like, what's it with all these fellows coming here? Trying to kind of walk bits of the border. But um, yeah, I started in Derry on, I think it was the 1st or 2nd of March and um, walked up until, or all the way um, through March until I finished in Carlingford. And the kind of the, I was planning to do it in the summer, which would have been certainly more sensible in terms of the weather. It was, sort, I think it was Storm Gareth that I got hit in somewhere near Castle Derg in um, snow conditions, trying to cross over towards Loch Derg, which was grim. At, so grim. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think there's something about the slowness of the walk um, that I definitely, you, you, you see stuff that you, you just, you, you would never see and you, would, you encounter people that you would never encounter. Particularly as me, um, as like an outsider, um, walk, walking through those communities. Um, I think, uh, again, with G Garrett followed, like you were saying, Peter, Gar Garrett followed the border really closely, including on boat. I, I didn't. Um, part, partly for practical reasons, it kind of, it, it, as having places to stay with, and I, have, I didn't have a, uh, I don't know whether Garrett did, but I certainly, I certainly didn't have a support team in the car to kind of pick me up or, um, and drop me off at the next place to stay. I, I had to get from A to B totally under my own steam. Um, so kind of the the locations of kind of places to find shelter was kind of critical. So it kind of it, it kind of veered back and forth, including through the Drummerly bit, which is one of my favourite bits of the board. That that railway bridge with the trees going across it over the River Finn is so beautiful. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I, when I began the walk. I thought the walk was the point, but then having done the walk and having had time to reflect on it, the walk was just kind of the process that kind of subsequently has led on to other strands. Um, I don't know if I'd do it again. It was pretty, it was pretty hardcore, <laughs> but it was great. It was rich. One, one thing I meant to, I was going to, meant to mention before was that the, the, the um, during, in the 1960s, there was a period where there was obviously a period of kind of relative liberalisation when you had sort of O'Neill and, and, and the mass in, in, in respectively in, in its north and south. Um, and, and both Britain and Ireland were seeking to sort of enter Europe, the European economic community at the time. And so there was a bit of an, a relative sort of opening up of the um, border controls. And one of the things they did was they extended the pass system for people who could use the unapproved crossings, the unapproved routes, um, which had been sort of... Um, had been limited to clergy and vets and things, and and and, and they extended them to people who needed um, to, uh, to 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 uh, cross the border for, to go to school or for work or, or or whatever. But you were only allowed to drive with your own family in your car. It was a bit like social distancing at the um, the, the current um, regulations. So you couldn't bring a friend or you couldn't bring um, a colleague or whatever. And the practice this got, that started up was known as the walkover. People worked out that you drive to the border, your passenger could get out, walk across, and then you could pick them up on the other side and drive on. And this was perfectly legal and perfectly um, within the laws. And there was, there's, a, there's a wonderful letter um, in, in the, the National Archive, the British National Archives in Kew from, um, uh, it was suggested this this law has become a mockery because people are just walking across so we should just let them extend the thing so they're allowed to to, to take other passengers and the customs official has written back about a three-page letter saying saying that this should not be done under any circumstances if you don't understand these people if you give them an inch they'll take a mile and every concession is made they treat it as a right and demand some new concession is made <laughs> Ashin, I'm going to we're, we're out of time. I'm going to give you the last word um, on this. Um, you know, these liminal spaces, you know, people, people find a way, don't they? Um, it's, it's in our nature to come together. We want, you know, we want to know our neighbours. And, that, you know, I think it was quite interesting that yourself and Peter used to be neighbours 
and that's just just coincidental. Uh, but um, neighbors are important, do you know, um, and and we make those connections and they stay with us, and we, somehow we might cross paths with those people again. We might be out for a walk wherever we live. Um, so uh, walking neighbors, uh, but these spaces will exist. They exist within us all, I suppose. And I suppose I just want you to kind of maybe tell me, you know, think about the next walk you're going to do, or, or what's the, what's the plan for this uh, the next demo? I've already, I've already answered know, that in the chat. I know you did, but I want you to wrap it up there. Anna, now. We're there, nice, nice and neat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And like one of the things that kept coming back to me through my PhD, and it's so simple, but it's, it's yeah. all about connection. And I feel like this year we haven't been, we've got through this whole thing and not mentioned COVID really at all, which is amazing and remarkable yeah. and great. But, uh, you know, connection is all the more important. And I think that the world is becoming an increasingly collaborative place, the way we work. And uh, I, I'm here for that. Just opening lines of communication, sharing what you're doing and building connections between people on different scales, different places, virtually yeah. and in person. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're, we're up. So thank you very much, uh, Ashton, Peter and Tom.